Thank you, team. You can go ahead and be seated. And as you are, I want to welcome you here uh, to Crossroads Church today, uh, wherever you may be, whether that is online at YouTube, Facebook, uh, Crossroads Live, uh, or here, of course, in Thornton. Uh, it is good to have you today. If you are new with us, my name is Matt Manning. I'm the senior pastor uh, here at Crossroads. And today, we are right in the middle of a series that we're calling The Body, where we're walking through the significance uh, and importance of the church. And as we begin today, I want you to imagine with me a line that goes as far to the east and as to the west as you can imagine. Now, this line for us would be the timeline of eternity. And what I want you to do is I want you to take and I want you to put a slash in the middle of that line, like a razor thin slash right through the middle of that line. I don't know if you can see it on our screen here or not, uh, but that slash right in the middle. And what that little slash represents is your, the duration of your life on this earth. Now from here, looking at this slash, it's hard for us to see whether that slash is 20 years or 50 years or 80 years or even 100 years. But what we can all agree is that that slash is a gift. It's hard to imagine a more treasured gift than the gift of life, isn't it? And yet, it would be my opinion that the majority of people squander this gift and waste their lives, spending their entire lives ultimately on things that do not matter. When we open the Bible, we're encouraged to realize that it doesn't actually have to be this way. That God has offered to us what we might call the great invitation. He has invited us in the midst of this slash to connect with what he is doing and invest with him in things that ultimately that will matter forever. It's a remarkable invitation, which is why for me it is so confusing as to why Christians around the world, Christians in the U.S., dare I even say Christians at Crossroads Church seem virtually uninterested in that invitation. And it causes me to ask the question, do we think that we have something better to do than the great invitation that God has offered to each and every one of us? Today as we gather, I want to do my very best to help you understand what this great invitation is and then to encourage you to a place where you can ultimately see why it matters. And the way that we're going to do that today is by looking at Ephesians chapter 4. And so if you have a Bible, I invite you to go ahead and turn there. Again, if you're new, we're on this journey uh, in this series called The Body where we're taking this journey to discover what is really the biblical view of church. And what we've seen so far is, is that when it comes to church, particularly when the New Testament writers begin writing about church, they don't write about it as an organization or an institution or even a building like we tend to, but rather they talk about it as this living, breathing organism that they call the body. And the body, when you open up the New Testament, is the predominant metaphor, particularly that Paul uses to describe the unity that's found within the church and the way that its members or the people function within it. And so last week, if you were here with us, we looked at the first six verses of Ephesians chapter 4, and what we saw last week and what we discovered was that we as believers are perfectly united in Jesus, that we are equal in every way, not because of our performance, not because of our, you know, how smart we are or how articulate we are, not even because of our own stories, that we are equal in every way because we are equally in Jesus. And we stand equal in Jesus now, today, and forever into eternity. And because of that great truth, Paul implores us, he begs us, language that very rarely does he use, he's pleading with us to maintain that unity in the church so that it is vibrant and viable and visible in the world in which we live. In fact, Jesus, in John chapter 17, goes so far as to pray for you and me, thousands of years into the future, that you and I would embody this, this characteristic, that what we saw and discovered last week is that when it comes to the church, the defining characteristic of the church is that of unity, where we maintain the unity in the spirit. And Jesus says that when we go out into the world and we show the world how unified we are as a church, then the world will know that he, Jesus, is the one who sent us. 
And so it's out of that great reality, out of that significant truth, that Paul moves us to the energizing reality of the diversity within the church and the great invitation that God offers to each and every one of us. We pick, up, we pick it up in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Here's what Paul writes to us. He says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, as we read this verse together, you might notice pretty quickly that the verse actually starts with a but. It's an interesting way to start a sentence, but it, it creates a contrast within it. Why would Paul start with a but? Well, the reason for that is from Paul's perspective, he spent the first six verses writing a pretty strong argument as to why the unity of the Spirit is the chief characteristic when it comes to the church. And as he's writing all this down, he foresees that there's a danger that awaits the church in thinking, possibly believing, that when it comes to unity, that he means uniformity. Now, if you think of uniformity, think of uniformity like in a band, right? Uniformity would be us all playing the same instrument with the same note of the same song all the time. Like, that would be a pretty dirge of a song. And Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, and he's saying, look, when it comes to the church, that we are to be unified, but unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean uniformity, that you are living in this world, that you are doing this unified as a church, that God calls us to maintain the unity as a body, but in that unity there is great diversity. You can think of the diversity in the church like your own body, that when it comes to your own body, it's made up of an almost incomprehensible number of unique parts that all function together, that every member of your body, whether you know it to be strong or weak, whether it is hidden or pervasive, whether you believe it to be important or even unimportant is necessary. That you and I, we would be absolutely, absolutely overwhelmed if we could see a list of all the diverse parts in what they do to make it possible for us to walk across the room or to eat an apple or to teach a class, or to throw a ball with our kids. That we would be absolutely overwhelmed if we could see a list of what all the different parts of our body do enable us, that enable us to do what we do every day of our lives. And Paul says, so it is with the church. That there's this great unity with the church, this great unity in which all the members work together as a body to accomplish the everyday things of the church. All of that is wrapped up in the but. He says, but grace, verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, oftentimes when we read chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, if you're a Christian, if you've been around church world for a while, then we place Ephesians chapter 4 in the category of spiritual gifts, where spiritual gifts are talked about. And that's right to do so. You can see the language here. It's talking about gifts. However, I would like to say today that when it comes to spiritual gifts, I think by and large that we have really misunderstood and even confused this whole conversation around spiritual gifts. And what I want to do today is I want to suggest to you, I want to suggest to you a way of thinking about spiritual gifts that may grade against the way that you were taught. It may even grade against the way that we have taught this as a church, even in settings that I have led. What I want to suggest to you today is that when it comes to spiritual gifts, that they are not miraculous or special gifts given to you at the point of your salvation. I want to suggest to you today that when it comes to your gifts, that you need not distinguish them from the talents which, which God has also given to you. I would suggest today that it has nothing to do with discovering them or defining them or even labeling them. That I don't think that spiritual gifts have anything to do with any of that. Now, while some of that is helpful, by and large, what I believe that we've done is created a system that we've overlaid onto the scriptures when it talks about spiritual gifts. Listen, from your very conception, the scriptures teach us that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That from your birth, the moment that you entered into this world, that you were designed exactly the way that God intended you to be designed. That when you become a believer, 
All that you are, all that you are fearfully and wonderfully made is now spirit infused because the Holy Spirit is now dwelling in you. Now all that you are designed to be is now empowered by the Spirit. And so when the scriptures talk about spiritual gifts, what it's referring to is the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit empowers us to really fulfill our calling, our calling. The language that Paul uses in verse 7 here is surrounded by grace. It's surrounded by grace. It's, he's pointing us to the fact that it's on the basis of God's grace and God's grace alone. This is Ephesians 2.8. If you, if you remember Ephesians 2.8, it goes like this, that you've been saved by grace. This is not of your own doing so that no one can boast, but that this is a gift from God. That it's on the basis of of grace that we have received, that is, we have been given this great invitation to invest ourselves, our lives, in something that will matter forever. And the idea here that Paul is is getting at in verse 7 is that every single person, every single person who has trusted Jesus as their Savior has a calling, and that that calling is a high and holy calling. That if you're here today and you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you have a calling on your life. Lately, I've been very much convinced that it is really a disservice to call what you do volunteer. And the reason that I'm kind of riding down this road is because I believe it's a bit misleading. When we say volunteer in our language, what we mean is that it's really that it's optional, that you can choose to do it or you can choose not to. Let me tell you, One day, when you're standing before God, you're going to give an account for your life, and on that day, you will realize that the calling that God has placed on your life is not optional. It cannot, we cannot on one hand stand here and say that the calling that you have in Jesus is high and holy, and on the other hand say that it is also optional. It has to be one or the other, it cannot be both, and the Bible is very clear that your calling is high and holy that God has called each of us to play our role within the body supernaturally trained and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul says all of this is happening by grace, verse 7. But by grace, but by grace, which is the gift of God, was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, verse 8, it says, when he ascended on high, He led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. (laughs) Now, what in the world does verse 8 mean? Well, verse 8 is actually Paul quoting from Psalm 68. And in Psalm 68, we have this story, this song of celebration, that's celebrating a king who has led his people from Egypt to Mount Sinai in order to receive the law, and then from Mount Sinai to Jerusalem, where he ascends as the victorious king, and where there's this grand celebration as he leads this host of captives that he has freed. That's what's going on in Psalm 68. And what Paul's implying for us here is that when it comes to Jesus, he's saying that Jesus is this victorious king that the Messiah figure in Psalm 68 was and is and has always been pointing to Jesus, that Jesus is this king that's leading these captives. Now, when it comes to the captives, when, it, when, it, when we speak about these captives, think of these as, as leading prisoners of war. It would be those people who were dead, those who were lost in their sins, those who were in bondage to the enemy, and they were captured by Christ, they were captured by Jesus, then they were made his host so that when he ascended, they ascended with him. He's now talking about us here. He's talking about believers here. And he says about the believers in verse eight, that when it comes to the believers, that he gave gifts to them, that he gave gifts to men, that this is what he's speaking to. So verses, So verses 9 and 10 then really provide commentary to verse 8. You can go read that later, but skip down to verse 11 because in verse 11 we have these words. And he, that being Jesus, gave. So track with me here. In verse 7, Paul refers to Christ's gifts. In verse 8, we have Jesus giving gifts to men. In verse 11, we have this language that he gave. The question that we have to be asking is, what is these gifts that Jesus is giving? Well, Paul tells us. He says he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. 
what Paul is lining out here is more than a list of, of roles to play in the church. What Paul is speaking about here is people. That the gifts that Jesus gives, the spiritual gifts that people, that Jesus gives to his church are people. That he took captive a host of captives, that is, redeemed people. And after redeeming them, he turns right around and he gives those people to his church in order to accomplish the mission of the church. Let's make it personal. That according to Ephesians chapter 2, you were once dead in your sins. That you walked in the trespasses of your sins. And the moment that, that you saw Jesus and you put your faith in Jesus, you were moved from death to life. That all of a sudden you were made alive. And not only were you made alive, but now you get to ascend with Jesus into the heavens, that you get to be a part of, of God's family, that this is who you are. And as you become a believer, a follower of Jesus, Jesus turns around and he takes you and he presents you as a gift to the church in order that the church might accomplish the mission of other people coming to faith. There is no greater or higher calling than that, that this is the great invitation, that by grace you have been saved so that Jesus himself can present you as as a gift to the church in order to accomplish the mission of the church, which is saving souls. See, Paul looks out at us, and he says, these that I list here are not just roles that you take a test to figure out if you are, that these are people, that God has, has given people to accomplish the mission of the church. And as the mission starts, he says it starts with people, some people who were called apostles and others prophets. Now, when it comes to this idea of, of apostles, it's a little bit difficult for us to understand because apostle is used a couple of different ways in the New Testament. Sometimes when we read apostle in the New Testament, um, it refers to all of us. Literally, the word means sent out ones, that those who have been sent out to proclaim to proclaim Jesus. That's, that's what apostle means. And so sometimes in the New Testament, we see apostles, and it's referring to every single one of us. Other times when we see the word apostle, it's referring to those who have been sent out like missionaries, that they're going out into the mission field. They've been sent out. But primarily, and most often, when we see the word apostles in the New Testament, it's used to refer to a group of people, a group of guys, really, guys and who were given the authority at the very beginning of the church as it got established to communicate the word of God. That's what an apostle was. And so you can think of people like the disciples. You can think of a handful of others like Paul. And when we read in Acts, one of the defining characteristics of an apostle is that they had to see the resurrected Jesus, that they had to see the resurrected Jesus. And so just by necessity, there was only a few of these people who actually existed in the world from the very get-go. And their whole role is that Jesus called them to be sent out to speak the word of God. He, he gave them authority in this world but which they received from Jesus himself, and they wrote all of this down in their teachings, which is given to us in the New Testament. That's what the New Testament is. It is it's the apostolic writings of the apostles. Now, before the New Testament was written, God revealed himself through prophets. They were the ones who spoke the word of God. They were divinely inspired by God. That once the New Testament was written, the truth was defined, and there was really no need for apostles and prophets in this way to continue. And so it moves then from apostles and prophets to evangelists. Now, when we hear the word evangelist, oftentimes we think of like Billy Graham, right? Someone who is really skilled at sharing the gospel, sharing salvation with other people. That's not exactly what the word means here. In fact, evangelism here, the evangelist here is only used a couple of times in the scripture, and it actually refers to people who were not apostles, weren't the select few, but rather were men and women who were sent out to share the news of salvation and to get the church established. Primarily, this is referred to as Philip, who is in the book of Acts, who we see doing this in Caesarea Philippi. And then Timothy, who we find in First and Second Timothy, who also happens to be the pastor of the church in Ephesus, who Paul's writing to. So once you have the evangelists who are, you know, getting the church going, it moves, once it's established, to the pastors and teachers. Now, the pastor-teacher here carries the idea that their teaching is really one of equipping, 
Their teaching is really one of training. If you think of a band, the pastors and teachers are the ones who teach the people how to play their instruments. To which we have to ask the question, well, what are pastor teachers equipping people to do? This is verse 12. He says that equip, in order to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now, this might be surprising to you, but the job of pastors, teachers, is not to do the ministry. The job of the pastors and teachers is not to do the ministry. It's to equip the saints, the redeemed, those who believe in Jesus, to do the ministry. Technically, you do not pay me to do ministry. You don't pay me and the staff to go about doing ministry. You pay us to equip you to do the ministry. We're the band conductors, you're the musicians. Now, my grandmother is so proud that I'm a pastor. In fact, any time that I'm with her and she comes up to one of her friends, uh, she introduces me just like this. She goes, this is my grandson, Matthew. And then she, her face lights up and she gets a big smile on her face and she leans in and she goes, and he's a minister. Now, it's very tender and sweet, and I am so grateful that I have grandparents who are appreciative and supportive of what I do. But in one sense, she's wrong. I'm not a minister. I'm the equipper. She's the minister. You're the minister. That we oftentimes get this turned upside down, and we think that pastors are the ones that are hired to do the ministry. A few months ago, uh, we got a phone call from someone uh, who is ill in and out of the hospital, and they called us, and they were like, hey, nobody from Crossroads has come and visit us. And when we heard that phone call, all of a sudden, we were like, we got to investigate this, because Pastor Chris, he, is, he has created a, an amazing care system of being able to take care of you when you're sick, when you're hurting, when you're in need. Like, we work really hard at that. That's something that we pride ourselves on, that we want you to be wowed by the care that you experience here at Crossroads. And so when someone calls in and goes, hey, nobody from Crossroads has even contacted me, like, that shoots up all kinds of red flags. And so we started to investigate, and what we investigated is that there were all kinds of people who had visited this person in and out the hospital. In fact, they visited him in the hospital. They visited him when they went home. There was a whole bunch of people who were bringing meals to them. It just so happened that one of them was not named Pastor Matt. See, Paul says that it's important to understand that the role of pastor is to be the equipper. The role of the redeemed, the role of the followers, of the saints, is to do the work of ministry. Now, the way that we live this out at Crossroads is we do this in so many ways, that one of the most prominent ways that you experience this is when we do baptism. When we celebrate baptism, rarely do you see a staff member baptizing somebody in the water. Almost always, it's somebody who's playing a significant role as a minister in their life. And oftentimes, there's a whole slew of people surrounding the tub as we baptize them, all of them cheering that person on as the ministers of that person in their faith journey. The quarterly, quarterly, we have these parent seminars to help you understand what does it look like to parent well in your family. All of that is designed is for us to equip you to be the spiritual leaders of your home. That you do not bring your kids to this building so that we can spiritually disciple them. That's only a part of it. You are the disciplers in your home. We equip you to do that. Every year for 20 weeks, we take a group of people through what we call Stephen Ministry where we train you, what does it look like to care for people well? What does it look like to, for you to come along someone in a time of need so that we can deploy you when people are sick and hurting and in and out of the hospitals? We have over 50 small group leaders who are trained and equipped to help you in discipleship, to help you bring a, part, a place of community. The list could go on and on. All of this equipping is happening so that the body of Christ, as Paul says, is built up. It's built up to its fullest so that the mission is accomplished. Paul says you got to see this, that when it comes to discipleship, that discipleship is not primarily one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two the way that we think about it, that frankly that's a part of it but a very small part of it. Rather, the way that Paul speaks about discipleship is that discipleship is everything that we do together as the body. It's when we're operating together as this body to build one another up to create this beautiful image of what it means to be redeemed. When we begin to realize this, 
and the importance of this, it becomes very sobering, doesn't it? To realize that the people who are seated around you this morning will experience less in their journey of faith. They will experience less in their journey of faith if you're not a part of it than if you were a part of it. That they could experience so much more in Jesus if you did not opt out of being a minister. If you just simply choose to sit back and to to be a spectator. When you choose just to sit back and watch, whether that's online where you just tune into the sermon real quick and then exit out or come here and, you know, leave during the announcements so you don't have to talk to anybody. If you just simply come here and you choose to sit back to watch, not only are you affecting your life, but according to the Apostle Paul, you are dramatically and significantly affecting the lives of the people who are sitting next to you today. That your life in Jesus is so much more spectacular, so much more significant, so much much more great when you choose to participate. Other people's lives are so much more spectacular, so much more significant when you choose to participate in the body of Christ. See, there's this tendency to walk into a church the size of our church, pretty big church, to walk in and to go, man, this is a well-oiled machine. They don't need me. I'm telling you, that could not be further from the truth. Theologically, spiritually, practically, we need you. That we are better when you're involved. Listen, when it comes to the body of Christ, it is less when you are not active. The church was designed for everybody, every single one of us who calls Jesus our Savior to come together to accomplish the mission of saving souls. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. That God has designed you just the way that he intended. And when you come and trust Jesus as your Savior, all of that wonderfulness that is you become spiritually infused so that you can build up the body, so that you can be a part of the mission. Now, for some of you, I know that you sit here and you go, well, Matt, like, what do I have to offer? What what does that even look like? Well, here's just the one question to help you think through that. The one question is this, what are the talents, the personality, and the passion that God has given you? That you're already wonderfully made. You're already fearfully made. You're already made the way that God intended you. You've already been given the talents that God has bestowed upon you. How do you use those talents? What type of personality do you have? What are your passions in this life and how can you use it to build up the body? Let me give you an example. Every single one of you knows Eric. Even if you don't know Eric, you know Eric because Eric's the guy that high fives you and goes woohoo when you walk in the door. Everybody know Eric? All right, everybody knows Eric. Amazing thing about Eric is that he can name all 3,300 of you by name. He has an amazing ability to call out people by name. Eric does not need to take a test to tell him that he's a fun-loving, hospitable guy. He just is. Anybody who sees him is. It's something that God has given him. He's fearfully and wonderfully made. So what does Eric do? He gets here every Sunday at 7.30 and spends the next six hours high-fiving you as you come in, calling out your name so that when you walk into this door, you know that somebody knows your name. He's found a place. He's answered the question, how do I build up the body? I'll do it this way with the talents, the personality, and the passions that God's given to me. For some of you, you're amazing leaders. You lead businesses, you lead organizations, you started your own business. You don't need a test to tell you that you're a great leader. You are. How do you use that talent with your personality and the passions that you have to build up the body of Christ? For others of you, you love kids. Your face just lights up when you see kids. You don't need a test to tell you that you love kids. What does it look like to take the talents, the personality, and the passions that you have to invest in the lives of kids, to invest in the lives of teenagers, to invest in the lives of those who need someone in their lives, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? And Paul says, you are a gift. You are the gift, you are the spiritual gift to this body of believers. And Paul says, that's the way it goes, verse 13, until we all 
attain first the unity of the faith. This is what we talked about last week. Paul says that this is the way that it's designed by God so that we may maintain the unity of the faith. It's going to continue until all of that's real. That's the first. Second, until we all attain the knowledge of the Son of God. That is, until we all see Jesus and experience the intimacy with Jesus that we all long for. The third thing that he says is until we attain the maturity of manhood to the measure of Christ and the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is, until we all come to the standard and understand what is true of us, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we use those gifts in such a way to the glory of Jesus in this world. And Paul says, when we start to do it that way, this is the result, verse 14. So that we will no longer be children, this is immaturity, think immature, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness, deceitful seems, verse 15, but rather, now think maturity, speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. This is what we talked about week one, verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. In other words, what Paul is saying here is that we have, when we come to faith in Jesus, when we decide to trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we enter into this mutual commitment to one another to do our part to build each other up, to accomplish the mission of the church, to grow from children to adults, from immature to maturity. The language here is that we are tied together like tendons and ligaments and muscles that we all make up one functioning body totally dependent on each other. So let's go back to our music illustration one more time. Over here on the bass is Ryan. Everybody say hello to Ryan. Ryan is an absolute gift here at Crossroads Church. In any given weekend, you can find him playing guitar, the electric, the drums, the bass, find him singing. He is a, a fantastic musician. And here's the thing, when Ryan's playing by himself, he's the leader. He's the band leader. Ryan can choose the music that he wants to play. He can choose the signature keys that he wants to play in. That Ryan can play the melody if he wants to. Ryan can play his own rhythm. In fact, if Ryan wants to, he can make up his own rhythm, right? That Ryan, when he's playing by himself, if he messes up, he can stop, he can reset, he can find himself, and then he can begin playing again. That when Ryan's playing by himself, it's easy. When he's at him, by himself at home, it's easy. However, it's very different when Ryan plays with the bands. That now Ryan's not in charge, but rather Mandy is in charge. And it's Mandy who picks the, the songs. He doesn't get to pick the key signatures any longer. He can't make up his own rhythm. If he gets lost, nobody's stopping for him to figure out where he's at. And as a bass player, he rarely, rarely ever gets to play the melody. In fact, he's always in support. He's always in support of the beautiful melody being played. The reality is, is that it's much harder to play in a band, but it's also far more deeply satisfying to play in a band than it is to play it alone all by yourself at home. To actually contribute to something that is so much more than me. To, to be a part of, of something that is so much more wonderful is a special, special feeling. It's way more difficult, but it is far more deeply satisfying to come together as one body, each of us playing our part to make the music that is way more spectacular than any one of us could do alone to the glory of God. When we invest in the great invitation of our lives that God offers to us in our lives, we get to be a part of a band. And while it may be easier to do it by ourselves, the reality is, is that there is deep satisfaction in joining together to make, to make music to the glory of God in the world forever and ever and ever. And so here's the question for each and every one of you is how can you invest your life 
in what matters? How can you invest your life in what matters? What are the talents that God's given you, the personality that you have, the passions that you just, man, that you can't imagine not happening? And how can you use that to invest in what matters, the mission of the church that will last into all of eternity? For some of you that begins with acknowledging Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That maybe as we spoke today about being dead and, and experiencing life not really at its fullest, you look at that and you go, that's me. Jesus is sitting here waiting for you to trust him, to walk with him so that he would give you life and not just, not just life, but life that is satisfying to give you a life with purpose and meaning and satisfaction. If you're interested in having a conversation about Jesus, you can just use our text line. Text the name of Jesus to 720-513-1933. Will you bow with me as we pray? Father, we come to you. And um, Lord, as we walk through these verses, certainly our eyes are focused on what it means to be the unified church, to maintain unity in your spirit. And within that unity is great diversity, that we are diversity incarnate, that each one of us makes up the members of, of the church, the members of this local church, that you have given each and every one of us to be a gift to each other. So Lord, today I pray that you would help us realize that we are so much more, that our lives are so much more spectacular, that our faith journeys are so much more better when we do it together. And so Lord, I pray that you would give us the conviction of heart and the courage, not just to be at home by ourselves, but rather today to make a commitment to get in. to impact your body in such a way that it is able to fulfill the mission that you've given to us to bring others who are far from you into life with you. And so Lord, I pray that that would be so of Crossroads Church today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen.